The older I get, the more I realise how little I know. That might sound cliché, but it is true. Still, there is one thing I feel more confident about with every passing day, which is that online politics is broken. Something has went wrong. Progress is not being made, issues aren't being resolved, and whatever the problem is, it's getting worse, little by little, day by day, and it seems like it will continue to do so in the future. And I find that a little worrying, because if we are going in the wrong direction, you have to wonder where exactly we'll end up, and whether we'll realise we're making a mistake in time to do something about it. So today I want to try to confront this problem head on. Not to try to solve it, but instead to shine a light on what exactly seems to be happening, and how we got here in the first place. This is the story of how truth grew old and died, and to begin, we must first zoom out. Once upon a time, life was simple. People didn't have all that much, but something they did have was answers. What is the point in life? Why are we here? Where did we come from? What is right? What is wrong? Why do crops fail? Why do volcanoes erupt? Why does the sun rise in the morning? Where do we go after we die? Everything was simple, because religion provided the answers to all of the questions we couldn't answer on our own. This remained true across different periods of history in different parts of the world. Religion dominated society, and through this, society was able to function with an objective truth. The word of God, or gods. Simplicity would not last forever though, and in time a new challenger appeared that would question the foundations of the world as we knew it. In 1543, Nicholas Copernicus published On the Revolutions of the Celestial Spheres, which claimed the planets orbited the sun as opposed to the universe revolving around the earth. This was a great leap forward for astronomy, but not so much for humanity, as no longer did we find ourselves at the centre of the universe. And this marked the beginning of what is known as the Scientific Revolution, a period that saw the emergence of modern science alongside advances in numerous fields that would transform the way humans understood the world forevermore. This was followed by the Age of Enlightenment, a period exemplified by the belief that through reason, scientific inquiry, and the pursuit of knowledge, humans could find truth, and with truth, they could achieve progress. Thus, the Enlightenment was a time of optimism, where even if the world wasn't quite as simple as it once was, answers were still out there, waiting to be found, and if we just placed our faith in reason, science, and empiricism, then one day those answers would be ours. This was the birth of the modern era, and it is where much of our values and institutions that still exist to this day were first formed. But history did not stop here, as in time modernity gave way to post-modernity, and so once more the foundations of our understanding of the world came into question. Now, postmodernism can be a confusing term, in part because it can mean different things in different contexts, but if you want a simple way to understand it, then think of it not as what comes after modernity, but as a reaction or a response to modernity. Still, there's really only one part of postmodernism that we need to focus on, and that is what it means for the concept of truth. Before that though, let us set the stage. It's the 20th century, and life is changing at a more rapid pace than it ever has before in history. And at the same time, all the great narratives of modernism are being called into question, one by one, and being found wanting. The idea of war as a thing of glory died in the trenches and amidst the machine gun fire of World War I. The idea of technology as humanity's saviour was destroyed by the development of the atomic bomb and a looming Cold War. Faith in capitalism was shook by a Great Depression no one was able to see coming. Faith in liberalism was shaken by the rise of fascism and its devastating effectiveness. Faith in socialism was challenged as communism at last became a reality and came alongside brutal totalitarianism, widespread famine, and genocide. The great empires of the old world also collapsed or dissolved, leaving behind not a legacy of glory and triumph, but instead one of dark colonial atrocities. And new political movements in America and Europe questioned how progress had been achieved and where it might still have a long way to go. This is where postmodernism came from. Once upon a time, life was simple, but those times were long gone, and now people were finally starting to realise that. 
And this is what postmodernism is. It's that realization, the understanding that the world is more complicated than we once thought, and the feeling of uncertainty that comes with not being sure what to do about that. If that still doesn't make sense, then perhaps it's best to look to philosophy, where modernism was challenged most directly, as the Enlightenment emphasis on reason, objectivity, and universal truth came to be increasingly rejected in favor of understanding knowledge as conditional and constructed. The philosopher whose work most exemplified this was Michel Foucault, who argued that power and knowledge are always intertwined and sought to examine various ways power operates within society. Underneath Foucault's work, there seemed a desire to question the unquestioned and expose that which isn't usually seen, and Foucault went on to leave quite the legacy in his wake, becoming the most cited person in all of academia, across all fields and all of history. The impact of Foucault and other postmodern thinkers on academia was enormous, and within the social sciences and humanities, postmodern thoughts can be seen everywhere, as truth increasingly became something to be scrutinized and treated subjectively. Still, science was not exempt from the changing of the times either. At the birth of the Enlightenment, it was viewed as the primary means by which humanity would come to understand everything that needed to be understood. But with time, it turned out that science had a secret of its own which is that despite how good it might be at providing answers, there is one thing it's even better at, and that is creating more questions. Yes, science did tell us more about the world, but the main thing it had to say was that the world is more complex than we realized. And so rather than bringing humanity closer to the truth, instead it ended up taking us further away by revealing the depth of our ignorance. But it's neither philosophy nor science where our postmodern reality can be seen most clearly. After all, philosophers and scientists were merely observing or reacting to the world around them. So what does the world around us show? Well, we don't exist in an era of unprecedented change anymore. We now exist in a time where change has become the new normal and complexity is everywhere. We moved from small villages of tight-knit communities into sprawling cities of thousands of strangers and then beyond into an endless digital reality where the community is global and the individual is too small to even see. Say hello to the age of information, where never before have we had so much knowledge at our disposal, so much in fact that we become liable to drown in it. Once you were lucky to find even a single answer to a difficult question and a single book could be priceless. Now, the global data sphere is around 175 trillion gigabytes, with searches bringing up hundreds of millions of results, all for free, and the hard part has become knowing what to ignore. Once, your career was determined by that of your parents, and the hard part was the lack of freedom. Now, career options are endless, and the challenge is knowing what to do with so much freedom. Once, money was a type of precious metal, something you could hold in your hand or melt down for other use. Then, money became a representation, only backed by precious metal, before becoming a thing of its own, backed by nothing. Now, entire currencies are built on speculation, with the only thing determining value being people's belief in value. Once, the economy was based on easy-to-comprehend market logic, but now it's more like advanced quantum mechanics, where markets are changed by observation, and prediction is impossible, as it always impacts outcome. Our creative industries show an ever greater focus on nostalgia because it reminds us of a past we feel we've lost in a world changing too fast for our comfort, all while our online entertainment becomes dominated by devastatingly effective algorithms designed to understand what we want better than we could ever understand it ourselves. Nothing is simple anymore. Change is constant. We are increasingly disconnected from our material reality. And as for the truth, well, I guess that depends on who you ask. In 2016, the Oxford Dictionary declared post-truth to be the word of a year, citing the discourse around the Brexit referendum in the United Kingdom and the presidential election in America, while the popularization of other terms like fake news and alternative facts likewise suggest our grasp on the objective is not quite as strong as it once was. Not that most seem to have any problem with their own truth, however. I mean, appeals to my truth have also rose in popularity. Instead, it's everyone else's truth that seems to be the issue now. And surely this makes sense. If the world is more complicated than it's ever been before, 
If philosophy has shown us the flaws in reason and objectivity, if science has proven that understanding never leads to simplicity while making scientific expertise ever more unreachable for the average person, if there is always more information out there than we could ever hope to consume, if the economy is entirely unpredictable and value is subjective, if there is always more complexity waiting to be uncovered, then surely it makes sense that we struggle to find agreement through appeals to an objective truth. And surely the only response we can give to all this is to accept our ignorance. To say, yes, the world is complicated, unbelievably so, and it's just not possible to understand everything. It's not even close. There are an endless number of issues, perspective, facts and fictions out there, and no one can stay on top of all of them. This is not a problem that can be overcome by expertise. No one can be an expert on everything. Hell, you're probably not even an expert on one thing. Nor does the answer lie with your unique big brain. You are not the cleverest person in the world, and even if you were, it wouldn't be enough. Nor are you some inhuman logic machine. You're biased and flawed, just like everyone else you share this earth with is, and if you can see it in them, why can't you also see this in yourself? Not that your lived experience and your perspective isn't valuable, but it's just that, your perspective, one out of billions of others that you will live your life never being able to understand. And it's not your fault. You weren't designed for this shit, you're only human, your brain evolved to hunt animals and gather berries, and in another world it will probably be good at that. It would probably be so good at that, but that is not our world anymore. Our world is 175 trillion gigabytes of data, and the harsh reality is that you do not know anywhere near as much as you think you do. So, surely, the only thing we can all do in the face of this age of uncertainty is to admit this to ourselves and to everyone else. But we don't. Before the Enlightenment, truth came from God, and religion was able to answer the questions humanity couldn't. During the Enlightenment, truth came from reason and science, and reason became the main tool humanity used to search for understanding. As modernity gave way to post-modernity, neither religion nor reason were up to the task anymore, but people still had questions, and the world was more complicated than ever. And so, there were two options. Either we could accept how little we knew, accept how flawed and biased our opinions are, and how many questions would have to be left unanswered, or we could find something else to put our faith into, to play the role religion and reason played in the past, a way to simplify the world's complexities, to make it understandable again, and give us the answers we desire. I'm not saying this was a conscious choice, if anything, it was the opposite. In fact, it's that we don't realize what we've done that's half the problem. After all, the issue with religion was never that religion is bad. I mean, there may be some passages of religious texts we have problems with today, but generally, each major religion offered much by way of wisdom and contained many ethical teachings. The problem with the age of religion was that it was used to justify our biases, without people realizing that's what they were doing. And so we waged holy wars, we executed thousands under the Spanish Inquisition, we burned witches and we stoned heretics, all while claiming this was in the name of our gods, the same gods that preached tolerance and kindness. We didn't just follow religion, we used it to justify our worst actions, when really we were acting out of a desire for glory or fear or to maintain social order. This was the same in the Age of Reason, where again, reason itself isn't to blame. Reason was responsible for sweeping advancements across society and has been a vital part of how we live our lives both before and after the Enlightenment. The problem though was once more how it was used to justify our darkest actions. For example, we framed colonial expansion as being a civilizing mission that would benefit the primitive peoples of the world by spreading the wisdom of Western civilization, even if we killed many of those primitive people in the process. The Nazis utilized scientific theory to explain German racial superiority and the need for eugenics. 
Communist faith in progress and a greater good was used to justify mass executions and totalitarianism. Reason wasn't to blame, but it did allow blame to be avoided. So, both religion and reason may be forces for good, but that doesn't mean humans didn't do bad things in their name. And would those things have been possible if people couldn't use religion and reason as shields? Would a group of people be willing to burn an innocent woman alive if they couldn't tell themselves they were doing it in the name of God? Would the average German SS member be able to send thousands to a gas chamber without a belief in Nazi propaganda telling them this was necessary? Some people might be monsters, but they're a small minority. Most of the time people just make mistakes, and they're only able to make those mistakes because something is protecting them from seeing the reality of what they're doing. So, if something dominates our understanding of the world today and makes us blind to our own biases, this would be a problem even if the thing itself isn't inherently bad. At this point, it may be obvious where I'm going with this, but forget what's being implied. The what doesn't matter yet. The important question is how. How could we fall victim to bias in a time where we are more aware than ever before of the complicated and biased nature of our reality? Well, easily. The more complex the world becomes, the more we're forced to rely on interpretation. And interpretations of interpretation. And interpretations of interpretations of interpretation. We're asked to understand more than ever, but we're also more distant than ever before. We don't understand the news through witnessing it firsthand. We don't understand scientific advancement through performing our own experiments. We don't understand humanitarian issues through carrying out our own research. And we don't understand the economy, period. The only way we can manage so much complexity is with interpretation. And every step of the interpretive chain is an opportunity for bias to manifest. This doesn't even require malice or intent. We're playing a never-ending game of Chinese whispers, where reality is always getting further and further away. And as interpretations allow room for subjectivity, interpretations also become contested. In fact, the marketplace of ideas may even create a demand and reward for competing interpretations. And so, truth becomes like a commodity in a supermarket. We're presented with entire shelves of truths, and we get to pick which one is right for us, based on packaging, price, or past experience. This even happened in certain sections of academia, like the humanities and social sciences, where the influence of postmodernism led to objectivity being increasingly rejected in favour of a greater focus on the subjective. This occurred alongside a growing belief that everything is inherently political, as even avoiding politics still leads to participation by supporting the status quo and those who already hold power. This meant being political came to be seen as not only permitted, as it's unavoidable, but also necessary, as it's the only ethical way to avoid contributing to the wrong politics. And so, parts of academia became more and more political while embracing subjectivity. This proved very useful at exposing the ways in which society may have benefited some groups over others, but it also increasingly turned academic knowledge creation into a self-reinforcing process, where knowledge was produced in accordance with people's political ideology and biases, and the more knowledge created this way, the more people's political ideologies and biases were proven correct. And so, the more complex the world becomes, the more we're forced to rely on interpretation. And the more we rely on interpretation, the more we rely on ourselves to determine truth. And the more we determine truth for ourselves, the more we become trapped by our own biases. And the more we become trapped by our own biases, the more opportunity there is for something to exploit that. And exploit us, it does. In a complicated world, you have two options. You can admit how little you know, and how little can be known, or you can find something to simplify the world, to make it understandable, 
and allow yourself to always know best. This is what politics does. Political ideology works by taking our complicated reality and then cutting away at the complexities until you have a simple, understandable narrative that's designed to appeal to people's biases. Like all good stories, it makes sure to focus on an enemy, and like all good manipulations, it makes sure to include as much truth as it can fit. Politics doesn't work through lies because lies are possible to disprove. Instead, it works through hiding complexity, usually by substituting complicated questions of science, history, economics, statistics, philosophy, etc. into simple questions of morality. The result is that your story always remains true and is the only one that makes sense, and anyone that disagrees with your story doesn't simply have a different perspective or understanding, but is instead morally wrong. There are thousands of examples you could use to illustrate this, but let's take one of the classics, abortion. There are several issues that could be considered here, including fetal pain, fetal personhood, bodily rights, gender equality, the impacts of criminalization, the inefficacy of bans, the broader societal impacts, the rights of the unborn, moral philosophical arguments, religious beliefs, and so on. This is quite a lot, but many of these issues could be simplified if we could just answer one central objective question. When does life begin? In theory, this should be easy for science to handle. I mean, either something's dead or it's alive, there isn't usually much of an in-between. Science, however, has not only failed to produce an answer, but has also looked increasingly less capable of doing so as times went on. As with most things, abortion used to be simple. Long before ultrasounds and modern medical knowledge, life began at the quickening, which is the first time a woman feels the baby kick or move. This was meant to be the point where the baby came alive and received its soul, and this idea dates back to at least Aristotle. Older abortion legislation actually centered around this, ensuring abortion was only legal before the quickening, else it could be considered murder. Science, however, disproved the notion of life beginning at the quickening, and then kept going, complicating our understanding of fertilization and implantation by showing how many fertilized and implanted embryos are bought naturally, alongside many other advances in knowledge that make determining the beginning of life harder and harder the more you know. In America, legislators once tried to answer this question through common sense. Roe v. Wade famously allowed abortion up to the point a fetus can survive outside the womb, which used to be around 26 weeks, until science came along and messed that up too by allowing babies to be born more and more prematurely. And so, thanks to science, no easy answer was left. If we were to try to answer the question purely on the basis of logic, then the best answer might focus on brain activity. After all, if humans have a soul, most see it as being something connected to the brain, and brain activity is how we determine whether a human is dead or alive, so why not apply this to the fetus? Well, the reason is because we don't like the answer. Brain activity begins at around six weeks, which is far too early to be of much use in allowing people a chance to terminate their pregnancy and so instead we use other metrics like fetal pain that just so happen to be practical and line up with our historical traditions like that of the quickening. Still, this is all only scratching the surface of this topic and is completely ignoring numerous other related factors. For the record, Google Scholar brings up around half a million academic articles about the abortion debate, so maybe if you read all of them, you could say you have an in-depth and rounded understanding to form an opinion with, and doing so would only take around 228 years, assuming you don't eat, sleep, or do anything else in that time. Abortion is complicated, but if you admit just how complicated it really is, you basically forfeit your right to a strong opinion. You also have to live with the fact that if you or your partner gets an abortion, you really may be doing something awful, while also living with the fact that to not allow abortion has countless other negative consequences on people's lives. Don't worry though, like with most things, politics has the answer, which it achieves not by actually answering any of the questions that matter, but by instead allowing you to successfully ignore them. 
politics provides a return to simplicity. Either abortion is about controlling women's bodies and infringing on women's rights, or it's about killing babies and preventing murder. Take your pick, there's narratives designed to support both, and whichever you choose you'll have plenty of company. You can even tell yourself that science, God, history, or whatever else you like is on your side because, hey, it's not like they'll turn up at your door and correct you. And you also get a free pass to ignore anyone who might try to complicate matters because you know your side is morally correct, and so the other side must be morally bad and therefore not worth considering. And if your moral conviction does ever waver, just remind yourself of the central truth that drew you to your side in the first place. I.e., controlling women's bodies is wrong. Women's rights have sometimes been historically infringed on, and some people really do want women to have less freedom and care little for their rights or suffering. Or alternatively, ending the life of a fetus is wrong. Abortion can be prevented, and some people really do show a complete lack of concern over the way in which their own actions can lead to the death of an innocent. The truth is on your side. It's always on your side. It just happens to be on everyone else's side as well, and we've become increasingly less willing and less capable of differentiating between competing truths. A key part of how this system works is representation. Ideologies thrive through having an enemy, and fighting ideas can be difficult without accidentally acknowledging their complexity. Therefore, most political action becomes focused on fighting people, or at least fighting the idea of them. To this end, an entire online infrastructure has been created to reinforce your beliefs while continually discrediting those who disagree. Competing ideas are represented through an endless stream of videos, live streams, news articles, social media posts and screenshots that are able to cherry-pick their opposition by representing them through their most extreme or idiotic parts. Emphasis is placed on how biased the other side is, and as everyone is biased, evidence for this is easy to find. Interpretations are always made in bad faith, motivations are assumed or just invented, words are taken out of context, sarcasm and satire are presented as sincere and representative, and the marketplace of ideas is turned into one big kangaroo court where the opposition is always on trial but only ever gets represented by a straw man. Working alongside representation is the importance of repetition. As someone who knew a little about propaganda once said, repeat a lie often enough and it becomes the truth. And the more our complicated reality breaks down the borders between fact and fiction, the more impactful repetition becomes in determining what we believe. After all, people will believe almost anything if it is repeated enough times and they see enough other people also believing it. Meanwhile, the online attention economy continually rewards exaggeration and negativity while hiding the moderate and reasonable. Internet personalities and the media not only profit from telling you what you want to hear, but also have a clear incentive to exaggerate as a means to create better content and justify their own beliefs and purpose. Not that these online personalities aren't victims in their own right as well, as through the process of content creation they end up surrounded by other creators and fans who continually reaffirm their own views, all while they risk jeopardizing their career and future income if they ever stray from the party line. It's no surprise that online content creators tend to get more extreme in their political beliefs over time, while seeming to get captured by their audience. The entire internet has been turned into a factory that continuously produces reasons why you're right and other people are wrong, and avoiding this becomes almost impossible as one of the defining features of the internet is that it always provides choice. You cannot live your life completely neutrally. The content you consume, the places you get your news from, the people you spend your time around, all involve an element of choice, and all will push you towards whatever initial biases you might start with. I mean, everyone leans some way, and the system is designed to encourage you to keep leaning a little bit further. Some people are less drawn to this endless battle between left and right, but online conversations still become dominated by the extremes. This isn't a representative democracy, 
and 10 people being quiet has far less impact than one person being loud. And those who try to avoid joining in or attempt to criticize both sides aren't safe from the system either, because when complex reality gets reduced to simple morality, not having an opinion becomes just as bad as having the wrong opinion. After all, it's us versus them, and if you're not with us, there's only one side left. Neutrality in the face of injustice is siding with the oppressor. And so silence becomes violence, and at that point, you may as well pick a side, because at least then you don't have to stand alone. In fact, joining in makes a lot of sense. We're tribal creatures who have lost our tribes. We moved from villages into a digital world that spans the globe, and at the same time as this, all of the traditional things that humans form tribal identities around, like religion, social class, nationality, and ethnicity, came to be viewed increasingly negatively. And so politics was able to take on an ever-increasing role as a way to find one's identity and a sense of community. And this wasn't the only place politics had a hole to fill. I mean, if there's one thing history reveals, it's that humans have a little bit of a problem when it comes to hating people who are different to us. I won't try to explain why this is, but it's undeniably there, showing up time and time again during all of our worst moments. But with the ascendancy of liberalism and the belief that everyone is equal, all of the traditional areas we poured our hate into became first questioned and then later regarded as abhorrent. These days, you're not allowed to hate people for the color of their skin, their sexuality, gender, religion, or nationality, and doing so openly comes with severe risks. And so, politics became the last great bastion for hate. And what better quality to use? After all, skin color or sexuality are so superficial, but political beliefs run deeper. And not only is hating someone on the basis of their political beliefs allowed, it's often actively encouraged, just as long as you don't go far enough to commit a crime and make your side look bad. And why wouldn't it be encouraged? Hate is power. Some people might try to tell you hate is just an accident or a byproduct, but it's not. Hatred is deliberate. It's a feature, not a bug. After all, how do you win this great culture war of ours? You can't kill the opposition, you can't stop their genetic line, you can't remove people's right to speak, at least not in most places, and democracy is slow, unreliable, and increasingly, apparently, rigged. Hate, though, has an impact. Spread enough of it and people become scared to stand in its way. It silences voices that might disagree and makes an example of those who don't know better. Hate is the only power most people have, and so they use it to cancel, shame, bully, or harass, and it works. In a world where everyone has their own truth, changing people's minds through appeals to logic and reason are difficult, but trying to control people through hatred and fear is a lot easier. Still, you would think we might know better. It's the only lesson history screams at us to remember. It's the most important thing we teach our children, and we create laws over speech, making sure the types of hate we don't like are strictly punished. Everyone knows hate is bad. And yet everyone makes an exception when it comes to the people they hate. All is fair in love and war, as long as it happens to the enemy. I guess people hope the ends justify the means, but I do have to wonder just how much hate we need to spread before hate is apparently defeated. How much harm do we need to do before we can actually focus on trying to help people? And how much worse should we make the world in order to win this war so that we can start making it better again? The irony is that hate does silence people, but it doesn't silence the enemy. It silences the unsure, the in-between and the disillusioned, anyone who might oppose this trend towards the extremes. For the enemy though, hate only emboldens them. Hate is simply turned into the ammunition they need to tell their own stories. They capture it in clips or images, which they turn around and show to their side as proof for their beliefs, their actions, and their hatred. And so, each side just continually reinforces the other. A victory for the left increasingly becomes a victory for the right, and vice versa. 
I mean, who did Trump help the most? What group actually benefited from the Hogwarts legacy boycott? Who was united by Unite the Right? Who profits from Antifa? The answer is hate and division. Hate always wins. The game is rigged from the start. For everyone else, this is an unwinnable war that makes losers of us all. Still, we shouldn't get too tunnel visioned. I mean, hate isn't the only export of the culture wars. This great political conflict of ours has also led to a historic loss of trust in everyone and everything, apparently. This has gone hand in hand with the spreading politicization of all aspects of our life, and the connection seems obvious. The postmodernists did tell us that everything is political, but increasingly, everything is also becoming a battleground. The content we consume, the media we watch, the products we purchase, entire online forums and spaces, everything reflects our division, everything is a statement, everything is an opportunity. When I grew up, I remember hearing people say that you can't trust politicians. Today, everyone's a politician and everything is political, and so people trust nothing outside of that which agrees with them. And so, everyone is on the side of science, just as long as science remains on their side. Everyone supports the law, until it makes a decision they disagree with, and everyone supports democracy, unless they lose. It's hard to blame people that much either. Anything that's political really is biased, and we've become experts at identifying bias in all areas except ourselves. The sad part, however, is that at least establishment sources typically operate through checks and balances. Academic papers are peer-reviewed. Journalists have bosses and libel laws. Politicians get called out for lies and have to face elections and so on. None of this applies to an anonymous source on the internet, and so as people increasingly use political ideology to determine what or who to trust, they increasingly open themselves up to being misled and manipulated even further. And the more political and the less trusting we become, the less we're capable of resolving differences and making progress. That's what politics was meant to be about, in case you've forgotten. It's the way we make decisions as a group and overcome problems together. Different perspectives are meant to be valuable, and each side has a vital purpose in helping to question and balance the other, an idea which shows up in philosophy, both ancient and modern, Eastern and Western, and in both science and religion. Yet, all of this seems to have been forgotten. We have never been less capable of understanding one another, and less effective at resolving our differences. People care about one thing, and one thing only defeating the enemy. And it seems people are happy to destroy themselves and everyone else in the process. Online politics is broken. But it's no one's fault. Every step we took to get here is understandable. Once upon a time, life was simple and we did the best we could at dealing with the added complications that progress brought. In doing so, we realized how biased everything is, and how little there is we can truly trust, and so we placed our trust in the one thing we had left that we thought we could rely on. Ourselves. Without acknowledging that we are biased just like everything else, and so the more trust we place in ourselves, the more we become prisoners of our own bias. Politics exploited this by providing a return to simplicity and crafting narratives that continually confirm our biases. And once you join a side, the system is designed to make sure you never escape. Bias is unavoidable, but politics shouldn't be this way. Everyone wants to make the world a better place, but everyone also has a responsibility to question whether their actions are truly achieving that. It's not enough to say that the truth is on your side. That's what everyone says. It doesn't matter if you think you're morally righteous. That's what everyone thinks. And it doesn't matter if you can claim that the other side is worse. That's how everyone justifies things to themselves. All that matters is the impact you have on the world. You don't have to solve all of humanity's greatest problems. They are not your burden to bear. But you are responsible for yourself 
And I think many people are using politics to avoid that responsibility while accidentally making the world a worse place in the process. If there is one last piece of advice I want to end with, it's this. Don't trust people who tell you the solution to the world's problems are simple. If there is one thing you can be sure of, it's that the world is complicated. It is our fate to suffer under this complication. It makes sense that we might long for a way out and for something or someone to provide us with simplicity. And so people do provide that and they become experts at it. Don't trust these people, especially when they tell you what you want to hear. If there is one thing you can be sure of, it's that the world is complicated. So, if there is one person you shouldn't trust, it's the one who tells you everything simple. This is the truth in the age where truth has died. The world is complicated. Everyone is biased. Opinions are flawed. And understanding is limited. This is how the world is. You don't get to understand everything. You don't get to be right all of the time. And you don't get to be the one person that is immune to bias. All you get is a choice in what impact you will have. And more and more people are using that choice to spread hate. The world is not in your hands, but your actions are. So, what will you do? Thank you for watching.